Hey guys, and welcome to my review for the Rings of Power Episode 8, Alloyed. Well, here we are at the end of the first season, and to be honest, it kind of felt like this finale was tailor-made for me to dislike. As everything I didn't want to happen came true, and the one thing I did want, more Adar, was entirely ignored. So naturally, I was quite disappointed, but realistically, I never really got into this show to begin with. So a lackluster finale was pretty much expected. But thankfully, there were quite a few references to the books I very much enjoyed, even when they were placed in scenes I didn't care for, which is the case with the fifth best moment of the episode, as I chose Halbrand revealing himself as Sauron and his attempt to win over Galadriel. If you've been watching my reviews, you know I was dreading the reveal that Halbrand was Sauron, and thought it was ridiculous they were hinting at a relationship between him and Galadriel, so obviously this entire scene was a big disappointment. But I knew going in this was the most likely scenario, so I had already resigned myself, and was able to get past it enough to enjoy the cool visual effects like the shot of them as the Dark Lord and Dark Lady of Middle-earth, and the way Halbrand's face changed as they started to yell at each other. I also have to say I found Halbrand's character far more interesting this episode, as he started to act more like Sauron. His performance still doesn't come anywhere near Adar, but at least I noticed he was on screen this time, which is a big improvement from past episodes. On top of that, there were some cool references here to explore, starting with Halbrand mentioning the breaking of the first silence, which is a reference to the beginning of creation when Eru created the Ainur in the Timeless Halls, the first beings in existence, which included such figures as Morgoth, Sauron, Gandalf, and all the wizards, who then sang the Ainulindale, the music of creation which inspired the world of Arda and lands of Middle-earth. So indeed, Sauron is an incredibly old being, and while his powers don't rival one of the Valar, he's definitely among the most gifted and powerful Maiar. As a result of his long life, he had many names, as Halbrand said, including his first name, Maidon, meaning the Admirable, as he was originally loyal to the Valar and was greatly respected for his talents as a smith and craftsman. After his betrayal, he was named Sauron, meaning the Abhorred, but also had other names and titles, such as Anatar, Artano, Aulendil, Gorthaur, Zigur, the Necromancer, the Dark Lord, the Shadow, the Eye, the Lord of Earth, the King of Kings, and many others. In this scene, they also spoke about Sauron after Morgoth's defeat and his attempt to heal Middle-earth. Obviously, this is very different than how it happened in the books, but Sauron did in fact have a crisis of faith when his master was defeated at the end of the First Age. Having always been a fairly selfish being, the reason Sauron started following Morgoth in the first place was because he became obsessed with order and ultimately sought to reorganize the world under his own leadership. For this reason, he saw Morgoth as a beacon of freedom, a being of immense power who could sponsor his work while placing few restrictions upon him, unlike the Valar who followed divine law and imposed moral standards on their servants. However, once Morgoth was defeated, Sauron genuinely had a moment of self-reflection where he realized maybe Morgoth was wrong and his goals impossible to achieve, going so far as to actually surrender himself to Aonwe, a leader of the Maiar. However, Aonwe, as a fellow Maya, felt he didn't have the authority to punish Sauron and so told him to return west where he would be judged by the Valar. Yet despite Sauron's repentance, he remained prideful and loathed the idea of debasing himself or suffering humiliation, especially when he remembered the power and authority he held under Morgoth. And so ultimately, he didn't leave for Valinor and fled into the east, where he fell back into evil and made new plans for conquest. Moving on to the number 4 spot, I chose Halbrand's gift to Celebrimbor. To many, I think this was the moment he revealed himself, as this was a reference to Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, the identity Sauron used when he tricked the elves of Eregion into forging the Rings of Power. In the books, Sauron, appearing as the elf Anatar, claimed to be an emissary from Valinor, but there was something about him that made Gilgalad and Elrond wary. So Anatar was not allowed into Lindon, and instead went east where he found welcome in Eregion, as there everyone, including Celebrimbor, embraced the gift of knowledge he bestowed upon them, and accepted his aid in crafting objects of incredible power. All save for Galadriel, who was living in Eregion at the time, as she did not believe his story. Unlike in the show, Galadriel didn't know for sure he was Sauron, only that she didn't trust him and didn't believe his story about being from Valinor. As a result, Sauron wanted to stop her accusations and so tried to be extra nice to her, but of course it didn't work and so he instead slowly turned the people against her, eventually causing her to leave for the realm of Lorien. In time, Celebrimbor also grew suspicious of Anatar, but by then it was too late. For the third best moment of the episode, I chose the cult of Melkor naming the man from the sky Istar, which coupled with a quote from later all but confirmed he was Gandalf the Grey. The word Istar is a reference to the Heren Istarion, or Istari, the name given to an order of five Maiar sent as advisors to the peoples of Middle-earth, meant to aid in their fight against Sauron. Known more commonly as the Order of Wizards, they included their leader Saruman the White, Gandalf the Grey, Radagast the Brown, as well as the Blue Wizards Alatar and Palando. 
Although in the books, they arrived a thousand years into the Third Age, one version of events does have the Blue Wizards arriving in the Second Age, who then made their way into the East. In this case, they seem to have changed the Blues with Gandalf, who is now also headed into the East. And this brings me to the second best reference of the episode, and that was when the cultists spoke about the lands of Rune. Near and around the Sea of Rune, to the east of Middle-earth, were fascinating lands home to various tribes of men as well as both elven and dwarven clans. As all three races awoke in the east, the dwarven Iron Fist, Stiffbeard, Blacklock, and Stonefoot clans likely settled in the nearby Red Mountains, while the Avari Elves spread into Rune from their homeland of Quivienin. Men came to populate this region after spreading from Hildorian, and they became the primary target of Sauron in the Second and Third Ages, who built a strong base of support among the Easterlings of Rune, which came to view Sauron and Morgoth as gods and kings. I think taking this show into the East and showing the lands of Rune is a great idea, and gives them a lot of freedom to play around with as details about these lands are scarce in the books, and could be expanded upon in really cool ways. Now finally, for the best moment of the night, I chose the forging of the Three Rings. Although I disliked certain parts of these scenes, I did really enjoy seeing the process of making the rings, with all of them in the workshop together and the final shot of the three rings looked really cool. But what I liked most was that we finally got to see at least some of the rings of power. Though again, all of these events went about very differently in the books, where these three rings were actually crafted last and in secret by Celebrimbor after they had already made 16 others. In the show, it appears as though these three rings are meant to harness light from the two trees through Mithril Ore to halt the rapid decay of all elves across Middle-earth in the same way the two trees covered all of Valinor in light. In the books, however, these three rings were crafted by Celebrimbor not for a grander purpose, but instead as the culmination of his life's work, taking all his knowledge, including what he learned from Anatar, and making three magical objects of incredible power, with various abilities like bringing about prosperity to surrounding lands and influencing the minds of others. However, his work was sullied when he learned Anatar was really Sauron, and all 19 were connected to the One Ring, causing the elves to take them off and send the three most powerful into hiding under the protection of Gil-galad, Galadriel, and Círdan the Shipwright. In time, Gil-galad's ring went to Elrond, and Círdan's ring was given to Gandalf. Although Sauron captured the other 16 rings of power, he never got his hands on the final three. So those were my top 5 moments of the night, and like I said earlier, this episode and show in general is just not for me. I know people in the real world who know nothing about the books and they actually like this show, so clearly this appeals to some people, but I just don't think I'm the kind of viewer they wanted to capture with this production. There really wasn't much in this episode I enjoyed, aside from some of the crafting scenes and references, but I'm gonna skip over the more minor complaints like being bored during the Numenor scenes, to just stick with my biggest criticisms, of which the first two revolve around things I specifically didn't want to happen, namely Halbrand revealing himself as Sauron and the confirmation that he and Galadriel shared a romantic connection. I find it remarkable how they've given Galadriel so many powers and abilities, but seem to have put no effort whatsoever into making her a likable or even interesting character. Then to make it worse, even after she discovers Halbrand is Sauron, she seems to consider accepting his offer, and even after saying no, she keeps it hidden from the other elves. This for me is a complete betrayal of her people, and it seems to all be for the sake of her reputation and vanity. The other major criticism I had was around the forging of the Rings of Power. The reason behind what they were doing was pretty silly, but I actually did enjoy the planning and forging scenes a fair bit. The problem was it was all over in a few minutes. Why wasn't this the primary feature all season long? I definitely would have preferred more episodes about the rings and all the effort that went into forging them. To have it all done so quickly felt ridiculous. I'm also unsure why they only made three. I guess they'll make the other 16 later since they need 7 for the dwarves and 9 for men, but I don't get why they felt the need to do this all backwards by making the 3 most powerful first instead of last and with Sauron knowing about them instead of them being hidden. It was all just so meager and disappointing, which honestly could be said about the entire season. So overall I'm gonna give this episode a 4 out of 10, which is also the score I'm gonna give the season as a whole. To me it was boring, badly written, poorly acted, and in no way worthy of the Lord of the Rings name. As it stands, unless I hear that season 2 is drastically different, there's little chance I'll watch or review any more episodes of this show, and I'm not sure about making a season recap. I kinda feel like I should for people who might be interested, but I really don't want to, so we'll see. But that's it for my review of The Rings of Power Episode 8, Alloyed. What did you all think of the finale? Am I justified in my negative take on this episode and season, or am I being too harsh? And what did you think of Galadriel and the Sauron reveal? Let me know in the comments, and for the last time, I'll remind you all to check out my spoiler-free Prelude to the Rings of Power video, as well as my spoiler-filled videos about the Rings of Power, Kingdom of Numenor, and Second Age, which go over all the events of this period in detail. Then there's a beginner's guide to Lord of the Rings, exploring the entire history of this universe in 30 minutes. Links found below. So that's it for now, guys. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all later.
A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X. If you'd like to help the channel, be sure to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and check out the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.